Cool. I think we're recording. Amazing. Um, so Moira, I will hand things over to you however you want to begin this discussion. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, well, I want to keep it pretty freewheeling. I'm happy to answer any questions, but I thought it'd be fun to just start off since obviously we're all people who love movies deeply. Um, a question, the, the most, the question I most frequently get, you know, in all my years of, on my job is what is your favorite movie? So I'd like to ask each of you, what is your favorite movie and why? And let's, let's have Betsy start to kick us off. <laughs> cool. So I go by year just cause it's so overwhelming. Mm -hmm. Um, and my two favorite movies this year were actually purchased by the same company, which I think is funny. Um, the first is Parasite, which got lots of press for obvious reasons. Um, the second is called Portrait of a Lady on Fire. Um, it's a French movie, and I just thought it was so, so beautiful. And I was, I was kind of upset that it didn't get more attention. Um, but, and it's not really streaming either, so I can't tell you to, to go. It is. It just popped up on Hulu. No way! Oh, that's so exciting! I just got that on Twitter like this morning, so yeah, it's new. Whoa, okay, that's very exciting. Well, yeah, those are my, my, my two favorite movies from this year. I also saw um, a movie called Dark Waters. I think it's Dark Waters of Black Waters with Mark Ruffalo. It's sort yeah, of... Dark Waters. Dark Waters, yes. It's about a, a lawyer who ends up sort of um, championing um, the farmers and inhabitants of a small town that is being polluted by... Um, DuPont, a chemical company, and it's it's a real life story and it's very very intense. Okay, who's next? Danielle, how about you? Uh, yeah, I would say uh, it's nothing from probably this century. Unfortunately, I'm like way right. too old school. Um, uh, I don't know. It's so hard to answer. Like, what's your favorite? But um, I would say the one that that. I think has been top since um, is uh, all about Eve. Um, mm -hmm. I think it was like 1950. Um, Joseph Joseph Macarius, I think, directed it. Um, but it's just one of those old classic films with Betty Davis, who just like, I mean, storms in with like fire and music, and it's just amazing. Um, and the dialogue, the script is just it's, you know, it's very much a movie about Hollywood writing about Hollywood, so <laughs> Hollywood also loves it, um, but it's, I don't know, it's just something that hasn't been done since, and it's very timeless in its storytelling. That's a great movie, isn't it? That's the yeah. one where she says, fasten your seatbelts, where, what we're, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's so great, yeah. You know, people, the, the answer I often give when people ask me, what is your favorite movie, I sometimes say, I hope I haven't seen it yet, you know, I think that's, yeah. if, you're, if you want to be a critic, that's kind of a good way to think. But I want to hear some more of your favorites. Who else? Um, I kind of hate that question. Mm -hmm. It's so because it's so hard because there's so many like really good films. But um, I a movie that like I really love and is really dear to my heart is um, the Grand Budapest Hotel. Mm -hmm. It's like a movie that I just come back to and come back to just because it's so. I don't know. There's something about it that is just so special that I don't. I haven't really seen in another in another movie. Um, yeah, so I'd say that's my favorite. <laughs> that's a wonderful movie. It's so different. I yeah. remember watching it just being absolutely enraptured. I, I've never seen this movie because I have seen, I've reviewed more than 3000 movies. I have watched a lot of movies and so I watched so many and I think, you know, I've seen this before. I mean, technically I haven't seen this exact movie. It's like, yeah, I've seen this movie before. I know what's going to happen. That movie, the Budapest Hotel was such a, every minute I thought, I have no idea where we're going here and I love it. Yeah. How about Spencer or Sojas? What do you think? Um, I, uh, so mine's Rear Window. I, um, it was like one of the first like real movies I watched and I was like 13 or 12 years old. And I was mm -hmm. like, oh my God, this is awesome. And I just keep coming back to it. And like, you know, the older I get, the more I find to like peel back in it. Um, yeah, it's kind of perfect. Mm -hmm. I have probably watched that movie every year for, oh God at least 20 years. So I've watched that movie yeah. a lot. And you're absolutely right. Every time you watch it, you find something else there. And that's true of all great movies. Like Danielle, I bet every time you watch All About Eve, you see something you didn't see before. Yeah. You know, it's an amazing thing about movies. Books, great books are that way too. Every time you just, you peel a little bit of the onion away. It's, it's pretty amazing. And so Joss, how about you? Yeah, um, I would say um, two of my favorite films of all time are Boyhood and Call Me By Your Name. And both of them, I would say, 
I think the why they, um, I guess, allure my attention so much is because of how it's so much like a, just like a living creature almost. Like it just breathes a lot of the time where it's like, it doesn't seem like it has like a plot forced on it. It just kind of like meanders, but like it meanders with purpose at the same time. And so like, I just like love those kind of films that just have that very breathy, airy feel. Mm -hmm. Those are gorgeous, gorgeous movies. Um, one thing I was wondering, I didn't start writing movie reviews until I was well out of school. And you all are doing it, sounds like, as part of, part, part of what you do in, in high school and college. What do, you, what do you find at this point? What is the most challenging thing about reviewing movies right now? What's, what do you find hardest? For me, it's like just writing it, knowing like that, you know, you're like it. It's rewarding in and of itself, but sometimes it's just kind of demoralizing if you put a lot of time into something and then you just don't get a lot of attention since written reviews aren't as popular as they used to be. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's true for all writing right now, I think. It's, yeah. sometimes you have to write it for yourself and write it you know, yeah. from your heart and write it as best you can. And if people respond to it, that's amazing. And if they don't, it's still out there, you know, it'll, it'll live. And that, yeah. that's again, what's kind of great that, you can, that we're writing both online and in print. And what you write online is going to live there and somebody will find it. And every now and then I will get an email about something I wrote years ago that someone just happened to stumble on and that, that it really connects to them. And that just happened just the other day with something. So, so your, your work does live on and people will find it and they will read it. Just might, it might take a while. What yeah, else? I feel like one thing that I always struggle with when I'm writing reviews is just like being objective because a lot of the times I think film critics struggle with um, really approaching the objective of what they're doing is like kind of like translating like the emotional subjective experience that they feel when they watch a movie into words mm -hmm. and do it in a very, I guess, through an objective lens. So it's like, you're able to like compare movie A to movie B, but like oftentimes like, because it's like crosses genres, it's really tough to do that. And like, also because like a lot of the times film critics are kind of reined in by this like five star system, or, like four star system. Like, oh, if this movie has more stars, therefore it's better. And it's like, it's sometimes hard to like compare like, oh, if I'm giving this movie three stars, then like it must be worse compared to this other movie. But like, you might've had a different, completely subjective experience. So it's just hard to like, I guess, narrow down your film criticism to like ratings and to like, I guess, to like compare between your films that you've seen and your reviews. And so, yeah, I guess like approaching it from that objective lens is pretty difficult. Yeah, I don't like the star as a star system. I do have to do it. It's something I inherited when mm -hmm. I took my job and I have to do it. But I don't think of it as this movie got four stars and this one got three, therefore this one is better. What I try to do is I watch the movie, I think, okay, what is the, what movie did this movie try to be and how well did it get there? Mm. Which might mean that some really little low budget movie that really wasn't very ambitious but did a great job at what it did, that might be a four star movie. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't mean it's better than a, an incredibly, you know, slick movie from someone very late in their career who knows exactly what they're doing. It's, it's how does the movie measure up to what, it, what it's trying to do, which can be a tricky thing to sort of measure. But that's mm -hmm. how I look at it. And I do think that as, as a film critic, you are being subjective. You are very much viewing it through your own lens. That's all we can do as long as we're upfront and honest about that. Because mm -hmm. I think part of the joy of reviewing movies is, is writing about how they make you feel, you know, how they change you, how that kind of what kind of journey a movie took you on. And that's not going to be objective. You know, mm -hmm. I once had a reader write to me and say, just keep your opinion out of it and tell us about the movie. <laughs> that's not what I do. <laughs> that's not what we do. And that's not what this is. Mm -hmm. It's interesting, like, talking, talking about the rating system because, because of, like, um, you know, the, the cost difference when it comes to streaming versus buying a ticket to the movies. I use the rating system to determine which movies I'll see in theaters, um, even though I realize that there are flaws with the rating system and it doesn't take into account all these different like factors that we just talked about. Um, I don't, but I don't think I would, if I had the choice, like I, I would use it. I don't, I don't know. I, I think it's important as, as fun as it is to write a review of a bad movie um, there's so much care and so much effort and attention that is put into a movie from like not only see the director and the actors but also the entire crew um, that you still want to be compassionate with your words and recognize that um, 
whenever a movie is made, it's kind of a miracle that like people got the funding and all these different people to come together and make this thing. So like, I guess my struggle is um, sort of like the judgment aspect of it. You know, how do I maintain my own opinion without um, sort of belittling this work that so many people work so hard on? That might be why I only review movies that I really like. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but yeah, that's, that's something I really struggle with. Yeah. It would be a great job if you only had to review the really good movies, right? Right. Yeah. <laughs> I, I struggle with that too, because you don't want to be mean. You don't want to take pot shots. You don't want to be unfair. You don't want to be all snarky. But on the other hand, the thing I try to remember is that I'm writing not for the filmmakers. I'm writing for the readers. Mm -hmm. I'm writing for the people out there who are trying to think, what movie should I go see? And I'm not doing them any favors if I really go easy on a movie that's really bad mm -hmm. because I don't want to make the filmmakers feel bad mm -hmm. you know you, you try to be as as fair and as kind and as informed as you can be but sometimes you have to say this movie's awful <laughs> not go to this well you, you don't want to say you should not go to this i try not to say that but you do want to say i found this movie <laughs> really appalling and here's why <laughs> for me with rating systems is that i i try to only use them as sort of like a personal benchmark of what I thought of the movie like I don't really it sounds counterintuitive but when I'm writing I rarely use rating systems for like other people I usually just like I need to remember like okay what did I think about this movie and then I just it's helpful to just have that number right there next to it since my thoughts can kind of like drift in a certain way over time and can seem overly negative or overly positive if you're, you know, reacting to the critical consensus. So I usually just put it there just to remind myself what I thought of it at the time. So do you come up with that number right after you saw the movie and then use it as a reference when you're writing the review? Like, when do you decide on the sort of number? Generally, like, right after the movie's uh, movie ends. Like, I'm like, yeah, this is what I think about it. Like, it's like three and a half stars or something. And then I'll just uh, mark that down. And then when I write the review, it's like there to remind me. Anyone else use stars or numbers? No. <laughs> I I don't think they're they're not really useful for me. Mm -hmm. um, so I kind of just I feel like like words can tell myself a lot more about what I thought of it than like a number. It doesn't really it's not helpful for me. Mm -hmm. I know that it's helpful for some people, but mostly when I write, I write for myself. So yeah. Yeah, when I often my when I come in the morning after a screening, my editor goes, "How many stars are you going to give it?" And I say, "I don't know. <laughs> I, I genuinely don't know until I sit down and write it. And once I've written it, and I see, okay, this is what I think. Okay, well, this kind of sounds like two and a half or whatever. But yeah, I don't. It's interesting. I do the opposite of you, Spencer. I don't begin with the number. I end with it. You know, I, I do the words first and the number after. But yeah, what, there there's no one right way to do it. We all do what works for us. Yeah, I think um, for me, I don't use a number system. It's more just like everyone's saying, it's it's first starting off with, okay, internalizing how did it make you feel? How did you leave the theater? Um, you know, coming away with, like, was it the story? Was it the acting? Was it the interior design? Um, you know, what were the scenes, not so much the, the movie, but in those few moments, those few scenes that kind of left you. Um, and then picking those apart, I guess. Because um, I think like if you use too much I think like Rose was saying, like if you use the numbers, it helps for some people, but I think it's more for Hollywood standards, it helps. Um, like for Rotten Tomatoes or, or for like Metacritic, like it helps more for audiences. Um, but then if a bad review for a movie, like if a, a critic gives a movie that they just don't understand or, or a lens they can't kind of come from, it hurts those, that demographic. Mm -hmm. um, and so then that score goes down and it, I don't know, it's just like, is there's ways in which it helps kind of like categorize how you feel about it, but then it also hurts and how it's marketed and how that filmmaker can possibly get more funding for other films. So I don't know. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I do think things, I have a lot of trouble with Rotten Tomatoes. I do think reducing all movies to yes or no mm -hmm. is, is kind of, 
kind of a dangerous way to think. And it's weird. They pick up my reviews and they sometimes will give something a tomato when I would think it would be the otherwise and vice versa. Because I don't, I don't make that call. The critics on that site don't make the call. The, the oh, people wow. on the site make the call. So it is, it's a, it's a little strange. Um, it's interesting to think about like recognition. Like um, when, when we talk about ratings, I also think about... Um, I don't know. I just keep thinking about the Oscars. Um, I just read a really great article about whether or not the Oscars were even relevant. Um, and the critic who wrote this article made a reference to um, what um, Pong Juno, the director of Parasite, said when he basically called the Oscars like a local festival. Um, and, um, you know, I think in doing so, he kind of implied that you know, not all films need Hollywood sort of stamp of approval. Mm -hmm. um, but I was talking to uh, this indie filmmaker who came to my school a couple weeks ago who was sharing her film. And she was talking about how for a small film, receiving an Oscar absolutely makes a difference um, in, in sales and in, in the people you can and reach. Um, you know, more people saw Parasite after it was, um, after it won, you know, so many words at the Oscars. Um, and, um, but you know, there are some really real concerns about um, diversity, about um, you know the lack of um, representation in the nominees themselves. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I was wondering, you know, do you guys watch the Oscars? Do you guys care? Um, how important do you think they are? I'm I'm really intrigued. Yeah, like that's like a really good point because like I was gonna say when you brought up like Portrait of a Lady on Fire and I, I love the movie and I wish it got more recognition but like the thing was for Oscars they only accept one movie per country for the best foreign film category and so because they already chose Les Miserables they couldn't choose Portrait of a Lady on Fire as well which is like really annoying because like it's kind of weird to think of like narrowing down an entire country to like one movie like imagine doing that to the U.S. like how would you be able to like determine that and so like, I think that's a huge like barrier to diversity in like picking like the truly best films and like is a huge barrier to like, especially foreign like indie films as well. And so, yeah, it's, I think it's really frustrating seeing that because like, there's so many movies that like are overlooked because of like weird like rules that are like super outdated that are still like used for some reason at the Oscars. The people who um, vote like the Academy, their tastes, I find a lot of their tastes to be really not that great. Like they tend to um, overvalue biopics and, um, uh, you know, movies about like semi-recent historical events. Um, and those movies very rarely tend to be, you know, genuinely probing about social issues. Um, so the, I, I think that they occasionally get it right, like with Parasite, but a lot of the time there's, uh, it's just like I don't find their the movies they give awards to or the performances they give awards to um, very good. I watch the Oscars, but I know that I'm going to be annoyed by the Oscars. Um, <laughs> I I think like they're obviously important for a lot of films because they end up you know their sales end up going up and you know the directors and actors and everyone involved gets a lot more recognition, but it, do, it does all like feel very political to me. It doesn't really feel like, you know, this is the, per, the, the people who deserve, you know, be, it's also like silly to like, it feels weird to me to pick one movie, one film to be like the best film. Like you can't really, that's not something you can, cause they're all so different. You can't like, decide this is the best out of everything, everything that there is, because it can't be. So that really annoys me. And it all, it does, it feels so political to me. Like they're like, oh, this, you know, will make the Oscars ratings go up. So we'll do this. I don't know. It's, it's irritating to me. Yeah, no, I, I agree. Um, I think they very much have like a certain criteria that they go for either I think as um, Spencer was saying, like it's either biopics, it's, uh, you know, it's an old costume um, piece or it's um, like a drama piece. They always go for dramas or really long dramas. Um, it has to be like over 120 minutes or like it's just no one's going to watch it. It's not important. 
print doesn't have like the value that they see in it um yes i mean there is no such thing as an oscar movie or oscar buzz um it's very much just a marketing tool but i think everyone kind of falls into that trap and so it has to be a certain type of film um i think as you were saying before like it it totally lacks diversity it doesn't include a lot of people um in different perspectives and that is because of the membership um which they're trying to improve but it's slow um but yeah i watch it because i like their history i like what it represents in the industry not so much as like this elitist group um <laughs> um but just more of like a community of people who love cinema um and i think it's kind of gotten away from that and it's become more just uh, I don't know, just like glitz and glamour, you know, it's, it's losing its value and it's, it's chosen like the people who watch, you know, the audience um, ratings are going down. So I think they should change, but I don't really think they're going to anytime soon, which is kind of negative, sorry. <laughs> well, well, no, they, their viewership is, is decreasing, I think, by the year and they're really thinking of ways to try to um, engage more people and, and more viewers. Um, you know, they tried with the whole popular film category, <laughs> but that, you know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I feel like they should hire, um, you know, like, you know, people of our demographic and ask what we, what we find engaging because, you know, maybe people who are making the decision still aren't, aren't listening. Um, I think they're really struggling with viewership though. Yeah. Um, so I kind of feel for them. Yeah. Well, they are, they, the Oscars are interesting in that they're hugely problematic. And yet a lot of us, what I heard some of you saying is that, yeah, you watch it even though they're annoying. And I was, they annoy me. And I've been watching the Oscars my whole life. The main reason I watch is for the outfits. I mean, come on. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I always try to think of the Oscars this way. They're a trade show. You know, they're not for people like you and me to vote in. They are people who actually work in Hollywood and work in the industry. And until very recently, those numbers were overwhelmingly white and male and old. And those numbers are slowly changing, and the Academy is slowly making an effort to make it reflect more what, what society looks like, what all of us look like. But it still is a, it's a relatively very small group that does this voting, and that's why we don't very often see a Parasite, a movie like that, being celebrated at the Oscars. But then again, what a great surprise that was this year. That was fun to see. Yeah, so, I so think that like a lot of people don't really see themselves represented in the Oscars, and so they're like, I don't see myself here why should I watch this? It doesn't have anything to do with me. And like, I feel that way sometimes a lot about like Oscars and like big events like that. Like, there's nothing there for me. Why should I do this? Like, I, I will get nothing out of it. But like, I do it because you have to like, yeah, it's work to like, fight the feeling that you don't, there's nothing there for you. So what can be very interesting though is watch the short films, watch the short documentaries. And if you're watching the Oscars, listen to those filmmakers when they win. And those tend to be very interesting, interesting people who have who told some amazing stories in their films. And no one would hear about them if it weren't for the Oscars. And maybe after Oscar night, no one's gonna hear again. But I have been pointed to some amazing filmmakers through that. Where are short films shown um, in general, just because like you never hear about them or see them in movies outside of the festival context, I feel. Usually festivals are where they are, but um, I don't know about other, about other cities, but I know that in Seattle in the weeks before the Oscars, they will show all the Oscar nominated short films in theaters. Oh, nice. You have to do that, I would think. Yeah, and at, at also like at Brown, we have like a um, a, like an indie, I guess, movie theater specifically for like indie movies. And so they also show the same thing where it's like right before the Oscars, they show like the uh, short films and like the animated shorts. So I think it's like film festivals are like, like indie, like dedicated <laughs> like movie theaters. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, film festivals will often match up a short film with a feature. So you'll, which is long ago how movies used to be. You'd go, you'd go to a movie in the 40s or 50s, you'd see a short film before you see your feature. And a lot of festivals now do that. I did have a, a question um, since we're kind of on like festivals and awards. Um, if you're like an aspiring critic, um, particularly from like an underrepresented uh, group and you're trying to like, if your majority of people are like freelance and it's hard to get like, um, like free full-time jobs at publications, 
um, and to get like accredited um, at a festival or at an awards. I know like there's a huge press room at the Oscars. Um, and I was kind of just wondering like, since there is like a problem with diversity at a lot of these festivals, there's not enough coverage um, from underrepresented groups. So I was just wondering like, how do you get to that sort of level? How do you um, slowly make a path to not, not just like full-time employment or or just like getting accredited, how, like what steps do you kind of take? Okay, I think pretty much other than the Oscars, pretty much every film festival in the world is very eager to have people come and cover it. I know that at the Seattle Film Festival, that there's pr probably in, in the Seattle area, there's, God, I'm probably one of, I don't know, two or three people who are actually making a living writing about film full time on, on, as a staff position. But there are dozens and dozens of film critics who turn up to, to write about the Seattle Film Festival. And they are a really diverse group. Some of them are very young. Some of them are high school, high school writers. Some of them are college. Some of them are older people. Some of them, they, the, I know the festival is very, very ready to embrace anybody who wants to come write about them because they want publicity. Anybody, any, anybody writing about a festival is great. So I would say, look at, you're in Queens, right? You're in New York? Yeah. There are, are a ton of festivals there. Um, I would just find, go, go to their website, click on the press link, write to them and say that I'm writing for, I, I'm sorry, I forgot, I forgot what school you're at. You're, oh, NYU. You're, oh, you're at NYU. That's right, you're a senior. Yeah, then write to them and tell them what you're doing and point them to your website or wherever your stuff gets, gets published and you'll be in. They will be, I think they'll be very happy to have you write for them. I, I'm always amazed by how many people turn up to write for the Seattle Film Festival and they all get accredited. Mm -hmm. Festivals are generally happy to do that. So and it's a great way to start. Great, thank you. Yeah, well, unfortunately right now, I know the upcoming festivals are canceled, but <laughs> <they're>, <laughs> I, the, New York, yeah. the New York Film Festival is in the fall, right? The big one? Yeah, I think it's like September to October, but Tribeca yeah. is closed, so. Yeah, but yeah, the, the New York is right after Toronto. So that, yeah, try that one. Definitely, yeah. But yeah, and right now, um, when you guys are just kind of trying to get started and make your name, just go out and write things and get a website started and put your stuff up there so people can see it. Mm -hmm. And when, so when you apply for accreditation for a festival, then you can point to your website, say, Here, here's what I've, I've reviewed, here's, here's where it's been done. But um, yeah, just get your stuff out there. People are really looking for diverse voices right now, and you guys are all really good writers, and I know this because I've read your work. <laughs> Any other questions I can answer? I, I have questions I can ask you guys, but I, I heard you might have some for me. What, is there any other tips you have for people who, you know, want to at least do film criticism, like, you know, semi-professionally, like any tips for just getting started? Mm -hmm. um, well, other than what I just said, um, one thing I find, I hear from a lot of young critics who are eager to get started in the business. And one thing that, the fact that you guys can now write online, post your work online, that's an amazing and wonderful thing that wasn't available when, when I got started. It also is a problem because when you're writing online, people tend to write really long. They tend to write at great length because you've got nothing but space. Um, people who got started writing for print know that sometimes you have to write small and tight. And it's, it's good for you as a writer to practice doing that. So I would say when you're putting samples together, when you're applying, applying for accreditation, when you're applying for jobs, that kind of thing, you want to have a variety of pieces and you want to have some that are really short and tight. It's very good for you as a writer to know how to write a really good 300 word review. That is a very, very useful skill. And if you've never done it, it's time to start practicing that because it's going to be really helpful. Uh, I know that in, at the Seattle Times, when we hire freelancers to help us cover festivals and things, what we are looking for are people who can write smart and thoughtful and tight. So I would really recommend working on that. I also have, if anybody wants, to, I'm going to give you all my email address. Uh, I guess you can get it from Betsy too. But I have a, I have a, I have one of them right here. Um, I I speak to classrooms a lot. I speak to high school and college classrooms a lot about about being a critic, and I've written a kind of a couple pages of guidance in which I start off by saying there's no one way to write a review and don't listen to anyone who tells you. But here's some stuff I've learned. <laughs> so mm -hmm. if anyone is interested in that, um, I think, do, Bessie, did you send an email to all of us? Does that have my email on it or should I give it out? Um, I mean, we can do either. I'm also, yeah, we well, guess, uh, do you guys want to just write it down now? I can also share it after if you like misplace. Okay, anyway, it's just M McDonald, M-M-A-C-D-O-N-A-L-D. 
at seattletimes.com. And I will be happy to send you this document and answer any questions that you think of only after we finish this conversation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, no, I'm happy to be of any kind of advice. But yeah, writing is it's like everything else. The more you do it, the better you're going to get. And if you want to write about movies, one thing you have to do is immerse yourself in movies. And how much fun is that, right? You know, go find out what the great movies are and watch them and think about them and think, why is this a great movie? You know, Danielle had some really great thoughts on why All About Eve is a movie that we have thought about all these years and Rear Window, you know, as Spencer was saying. Movies last because they, they connect with us in some way. They show us something that, that, that moves us. And think about that and write about that and write, write as yourself. You know, one thing I also see, and I, I get a lot of um, young people sending me their reviews, wanting me to comment, and unfortunately, I, I'm not always able to help them, but many people are trying to write reviews in a very kind of bland, objective, journalistic kind of way, um, the way that you might have gotten, if you had a journalism class in high school, you might have been taught to write this, write in these very simple sentences, write about, you know, who, what, where, why. That is not how you review a film. That is not how criticism works. Criticism is creative writing. Mm -hmm. And criticism is developing your own voice that's gonna sound like nobody else out there. And all of you are already well in the way of doing that. But that's what I really wanna encourage people. Write like yourself. You know, don't, don't make your work very bland and plain so that everybody will connect to it. What happens then is the opposite. Nobody connects to it. <laughs> You know, have fun with metaphor, have fun with humor, have fun with, see if you can make a reader cry. You know, I had someone write to me the other day saying that I made them cry and I was like, oh, that's so great. <laughs> <laughs> there was actually, yeah, go ahead. No, go ahead. Um, I just like on the subject of sort of creativity, um, there was a finalist last year um, who wrote a really fantastic review of Bohemian, Bohemian Rhapsody. And the way she um, started her review was imagining um, being at dinner with her friends um, after a long week and there's this one friend who is like the movie nerd who is trying to get everyone to go watch a movie that no one wants to go see mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and it's I may be a position that we've all been in you know if we've studied film we know some older movies that like our friends don't really relate to um, but like she started her criticism with um, with this imagined conversation with her and her friends and then transitioned into why Bohemian Rhapsody. I think um, her argument was it's a movie for both the film buff and people who just like want to have a fun time on a Friday night. Um, and I just, I, I thought it was one of the most creative reviews that, that we've seen here. Um, and I just loved it. So, you know, she's someone who, who thought really unconventionally about how she would start it. Um, and maybe in that way, you know, it can become more relatable to your audience because you're not writing it like someone might imagine a classic film review. Like, in yeah, it. you're not writing from being up on the hill and writing down to people. Uh, two two years ago, I guess it was. Remember when the Grinch movie was was in theaters? That the the Flint Grinch. And I was writing my review, and I thought, you know, I really should just write this as a Dr. Seuss poem. <laughs> I think I will. <laughs> and so I wrote my whole review as, as a rhyming Dr. Seuss poem, mm. and people loved oh. it. People got really excited about it, and I thought, well, that's yeah. Nobody else wrote it that way. <laughs> that's, you know, that's, that's what it's all about. Have fun with it. <laughs> One of my favorite reviews um, is a review of the Lars von Trier movie, Antichrist. And the uh, reviewer hated the movie, but he was very, very glad that something that nuts got played at the film festival. So he wrote the review as like an open letter to Lars von Trier, thanking him for making it, even though he hated it. <laughs> that's awesome. That's great. What else? What other questions do people have? Um, I did want to ask, um, kind of going into like your process, your writing process and the craft. Um, and like once you come into watching a movie either like before, do you read other critics reviews of it or um, how much does like word of mouth affect your opinion? And then coming in after you're watching the movie, um, like what are some of the questions of the like, um, like assessments that you ask yourself, like just to begin to get your, your thoughts on paper? Okay, good question. Um, I really try, if I'm gonna go see something to review, I try very hard to shut off any um, feedback I might hear about it. I would never read other reviews before I've written mine and I try not to even get a sense of it. I don't even look, I don't look at Rotten Tomatoes or anything like that. I try to go in pretty cold. Sometimes you can't help it. Sometimes you hear ahead of time, oh, this movie's so great or oh, this is terrible. But I try <laughs> to, to close that off as much as I can. So when I'm watching the movie, I take notes 
Um, I don't know if you all do that. I find it helpful. Um, for other critics, I know some who don't take notes at all. I know some who practically transcribe the movie. They never stop. I'm kind of somewhere in the middle. I sort of write down little random observations. Or if, if someone says a line, I think I might want to quote. I write it down to make sure I have it right. Um, sometimes if, it, if something seems predictable, I might sort of write down, I think it's going to turn out to be this, just to see if I'm right. Mm -hmm. um, that kind of thing. And so that's, that's the movie. So I, I go to the screening and then I put it away. I try not to think about it for a little while. Sometimes I go to a screening and I have to write it the next morning, but sometimes I have a little more time. So if I, if I can, I try to take at least a day or two and just not think about it and just kind of let it simmer back there. And then when I'm ready to write, when I have to sit down and do it, um, I sit down, I, I write up, you know, I have to write up my thing, blah, 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 movie starring, I have to write up my information that directed by so-and-so, how many minutes, rating, all this stuff. And if I don't have an instant sense of where to start, I'll transcribe my notes. I don't always do it. Sometimes I never look at my notes. But sometimes I transcribe them just as just to be helpful and that and that I get that down and that gives me some impressions. And then the way I find where to begin is that I try to think of okay, what is the first thing that popped back into my mind when I was thinking about this movie? What and it might be a line of dialogue, it might be what the light looked like coming in the window, it might be a particular scene, it might be a particular performance. Um, just some very specific thing that is the thing about that movie that hit me. And I always start with that because you don't, you want to start with the thing that you feel the most strongly about, whether that's positive or negative. You don't want to back in by, oh, this is a movie that's about so-and-so and it's directed by so-and-so. No, 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 no. No, you want to jump right in with something that, that was the first thing that came to you, something that you feel really strongly about one way or the other. And usually once I get, once I get that first paragraph in, the rest of it just kind of, kind of flows nicely. And I, I'm not able to write very long because I'm writing for both print and online. And in print, we don't have a lot of space. So I'm usually in the 400 word range. So it's not a lot. So usually, usually it comes out pretty well. If it doesn't, I walk away from it. Um, the best thing you can do when, when your writing isn't going well is do something else. You know, it just, it doesn't, you can't force, you can't force it to come out. It's going to come out when you're ready. So I go do something else. I go walk around the newsroom. Here I walk around my house, which is not very big. <laughs> I go get a Diet Coke. You know, I go think about something else. And then usually when I come back to it, it starts flowing again. What, what, do, what do you all find? Does, does, do, you, do you find writing comes easily or do you find it hard? Um, I guess for me, um, sometimes it's like trying to get the right wording that just sounds like it flows. Mm -hmm. um, that's why I like usually when I'm stuck, I just like type down whatever I'm thinking, even if it sounds horrible. And I'll be like, I'll go back and like beautify it or whatever and make it like sound better. But, like I just like try to get my ideas down before I could forget them because they're usually very fleeting. <laughs> it's like a lot of thoughts just like hit me at like one time whenever watching a film. So yeah, I also find taking notes very helpful and like getting like certain pieces of dialogue. I don't find writing is really hard. I always uh, say, I don't like to write, but I love to have written. That's what I always say. Mm. So, the, for me, there's, so I have, I'm currently working on this, like, sort of, like, weird blog post thing where I write a little bit about every movie I saw this month. Mm -hmm. And what I had to do is I had to make two sections in it. One, which is just, like, regular full-length reviews. One that was, but there's another section where I watch a lot of movies where I didn't really have a strong reaction to it, or I did, but I don't really know how to articulate that very well. So I usually just jot down a few sentences, but having to write a lot about a movie that you're not sure about how you reacted to, or not sure what you thought about it, or with a lot of the canonical movies, there's times where I'll watch it and I recognize I saw something special, but it didn't connect with me at all. And I kind of have to walk that line between being honest that it didn't connect with me and also acknowledging its place within the canon. Th those reviews are really tricky to write, which is why I usually only write like a sentence or two if I'm doing like a personal blog post. Yeah, I think um, kind of as your point earlier, um, like I, I wrote my piece, um, like the waves piece for this contest, um, mostly because I saw it at Telluride and I strongly disliked it. Um, so, and that's just based on my, my personal opinion. I think, you know, I, I understand like audience, other audiences, young demographics really liked it. 
um, especially because it came from A24, um, and it was a different type of storytelling, um, which I think is valid, uh, but I, I literally was just fuming for months after seeing it, and I realized, okay, I just have to stop complaining and, and telling all my friends like <laughs> how terrible this movie is and just kind of come at it from a different perspective, a critical perspective, and just write out my thoughts and feelings. Um, so I kind of thought mine was a little bit too harsh. Um, so it's kind of, as you're saying before, like balancing the personal judgment and then also um, giving a fair judgment to to the, the filmmaker and, and also informing the audience, not just of like what you think, but um, possibly like how they might feel watching it or coming out of it or, or like kind of figuring out that balance. Yeah. What Any movie was that? Which one again? Sorry? Oh, I just missed which film you were talking about. I'm curious. Oh, Waves. I think it came out last year. Okay, um, yeah. I didn't see that, but I've heard it's not very good. Yeah. <laughs> it's interesting, I think, like, to think of um, criticism as a filter um, and as something that's therapeutic, just because uh, the whole reason why I started Gen Z Critics in 2016 was because I felt like you... Um, you know, certain people in the industry have power and they make movies that have a certain message and people watch those movies and go home with them and they just, you know, so many people just don't talk about it um, either because, you know, they don't see it with friends or family. Like I see movies alone um, in the theater um, or because, you know, they think that the experience ends there. Um, and when you have such a powerful medium it needs to be processed is my personal belief. Um, and, um, you know, you have some really extreme versions where you have like propaganda um, and movies being used as propaganda um, in, throughout history, um, probably even now. Um, but you also just have a lot of movies that have subliminal messages that you don't realize are sort of in your psyche until you talk it out with somebody. Um, I'm not, a trained professional in psychology or anything, but these are <laughs> just my personal um, opinions on, on um, you know, what it means for a movie to affect you without you knowing, I think can be a really dangerous thing. Um, so that's why I think everyone should be a critic and everyone should at least talk about movies, um, just so you know how a movie like even affects you to begin with. Um, so yeah, I. I mean, maybe that's also why it's such an emotional thing for me um, and why I need to feel passionate about a uh, film in order to write a review. Um, but um, yeah, that's why I think like using film criticism as a lens and a filter is, is really important. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one of the hardest things is writing a review of a movie that you don't feel passionate about in any way. Right. <laughs> it's just totally, well, yeah, that was fine. <laughs> you know, it's a surprising number of movies are that way. And those you have to really find your passion in there somehow. You have to find, okay, there's hiding in this mediocre movie. There's this one performance that is really pretty amazing and let's pull that apart. You know, or hiding in here is is a story that, you know, could have been compelling. Yeah, it's it, it can be hard to manufacture that sometimes. I have a question for you, Maura, actually. Um, before you said something um, that kind of caught my attention, you said you were talking about how like the Oscars, uh, sort of the voting people are composed of people like in the industry. Mm -hmm. um, do you consider yourself as a critic, a part of the industry? Um, you know, what, what does that mean? What do you see as your role? Interesting question. Um, no, I don't. I don't consider myself part of the film industry. I, fit, I, I see myself as part of the journalism industry. And also because I write for a newspaper. You know, I'm, the, there are all kinds of film critics out there for all kinds of outlets and many on their own and doing amazing work. Um, I'm a journalist who writes for a newspaper. And my, my job is to inform readers of the Seattle Times and any, any interested people what I think of what is going on in the state of film. And specific films that I'm reviewing and movies that I write about in general. Mm -hmm. And I actually, I don't just write about movies anymore. For a long time, I was just the film critic and that was my job. A couple years ago, my job got expanded to include some other things because our paper got smaller. Mm -hmm. And I write about books now and I write about dance and a few other things. But although film, I think, will always be kind of my first love at work. Mm -hmm. But no, I don't, I don't feel part of the industry. I don't think I should be. 
you know, nobody in the, in the industry consults with me before they, before they release a movie. You know, I comment on a movie after they've done it. You know, it's not my job to influence them in any way. Um, I don't think critics do influence the Academy very much. I, uh, not the Academy, I mean the, the industry. I, th I think audiences, people who buy tickets, that's what influences them. I have a, a question kind of in response to um, Betsy, like you were saying, you watch movies more alone. Um, and I think we all do in this, in this day and age. Um, but like, do you think that kind of, uh, the question to all of you, like, do you think that affects, like, like impacts your, your review of movies? Like if you watch um, a film that maybe you went in not liking or maybe you were skeptical of, or that you loved and then you try to share it with other people, um, like, does it, does having somebody sit beside you kind of help you, um, like, critique the film? Like, because you can talk about it with them afterwards rather than just kind of, like, sitting in your own mind with it afterwards? Curious how you, how you all respond to this. Um... I think, yeah, for me, the environment really impacts me a lot. It's not just like sitting at home versus like at the movie theater, but also like being around people who either A, like love the movie or B, hate it. And so like seeing the different points of view, I feel like even if I don't intend it, intend other points of view to like affect mine, I think it happens obviously without my control. And so um, in like small ways. And so I think instead sometimes like, having opposing points of view either strengthens minds or makes me reconsider like how to look at a movie. But I think I always like love discussing a movie afterwards with someone and like, cause there are always like maybe things that like I didn't pick up that I'm like, Oh, that was really clever that they brought in that I didn't really catch. And so I think it's always good to like discuss and be a super open and like just absorb information from others as well. Just like as a give and take uh, before like really going into like writing a review. So you kind of like have some sort of open mindedness when you're writing, knowing that you have other, points of view you've taken into consideration. So, so for me, it's the way I think about that without like, the way I managed to like deal with the fact that, you know, the situation you watch a movie in affects the way you think about it, I believe, is that whenever you watch a movie, there's all these given like outside variables and you just kind of have to like, you know, recognize that, but you can't like get the, I, you can never get like the perfect movie viewing experience or the most like objective movie viewing experience because like, you know, watching a fun movie with friends is going to make the movie seem better. Um, and watching like a movie, like, you know, you know, watching a movie with someone who hates the movie, but you really like the movie is going to make the movie seem worse probably. So it's just kind of one of those things that you're going to have to learn to accept like, like movies are going to change even though they're fixed in time they're going to change on a viewing to viewing basis i appreciate watching movies with other people um because i think everyone has such a different experience when you watch a movie because everyone comes at it from it comes to it from like a different place in life and so different parts of the movie might have affected the might have affected them more than they affected you. And so it's interesting to talk to people about movies. I hate watching a movie and then having no one to talk to about it. So I've spoiled a good many movie for my family and friends by that, by accident. So I'm like, I need to talk to someone about this movie. So I'm gonna explain the whole plot to you and then talk to you about it. But most of the time I don't like that. But, um, cause I think that really, cause I come out of movies often with like a very set opinion, a set experience that I had um, and so it's interesting to just bounce ideas off of another person who has had, has seen the same thing, but had a different experience. I really appreciate that. I, it's interesting, like your question, Danielle, because um, I was thinking about um, different, so different mediums that you can watch movies in, now include YouTube. Um, you can watch a TV episode or a movie on YouTube. And um, I, I, always read comments on YouTube videos. It's just, I feel like how our generation interacts sometimes yeah. unfortunately. Um, so like when I see a YouTube video, my view of it is always, always, always affected by the comments below and like the number of likes they got, right? Um, with movies in a theater, you don't have that kind of equivalent experience, but um, 
I don't know. It's just something I thought I would bring up just because like there's so many mediums now that get shorter and shorter. <laughs> um, but yeah. I do think I really make a point of not discussing things with people before I'm, before I'm writing my review. And I, again, we, we all are going to figure out our way that works best for us. I do think as a critic, you need to be careful that what you're writing is indeed your voice and not kind of other stuff that, that it can be kind of dangerous if you start writing, wanting to make sure that you're appealing to every point of view. Um, I try to just kind of write it as, as what, what my own response was. Yeah, no, I was just kind of curious, like I was thinking about like another medium like television, which is kind of um, overshadowing film mm -hmm. um, in the last like 10 years um, and kind of as a critic, like balancing, reviewing television because it is like, unfortunately more creative and innovative right now for talent um, rather than film and kind of seeing like television, we're all like watching Netflix and Amazon. So it's all streaming and you're either sharing it with someone else or you're kind of just, you know, binging it by yourself. Um, whereas film kind of majority of people, well, I wouldn't say majority, but like dedicated film, you know, goers kind of go to the theaters and you're forced to be with others. So it gives you that sense of community. Um, whereas television, it's, it's very much in the home. So, thinking about that. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see how, how long this current kind of forced isolation goes that, you know, we're all just watching TV alone. Mm -hmm. but we're <laughs> and we're not going out to the movies seeing things with strangers anymore. It's going to be a while before we can do that again. Yeah. It's sad. I have um, sort of on the question, sort of on the topic of advice. Um, I know you were talking about before the importance of um, just like really, you know, establishing ourselves, um, at festivals, you know, asking, um, for the, um, you know, the badge that you need to get into the festival as, as a young critic. Um, do you have advice on how to obtain screeners specifically? Um, or whether that only happens through like when you are working for a publication or whether you can, you know, ask a filmmaker or a company for a screener, how does that work? Um, I can only tell you the way it works in Seattle, but I'm sure every city has its own. Um, you you find out who is, who is the publicity company that is handling local screenings and screeners, and get hold of that of that person. The way the way many people find out in Seattle is they email me to ask. <laughs> so you know, ask ask your local film critic; they'll be glad to help you. They can point you in the right direction. And I often hear from high school and college writers who want to review films for their high school and college papers. And I've gotten a lot of them able to get credentials and they come and say hi to me at screenings. So it's very possible. Um, in terms of doing it as an individual, if you don't have any kind of outlet you're writing for, if you don't have your school publication or something, that might be a little trickier. Um, I am not sure. If, if there is a, a, an, an indie filmmaker whose work you like, find a way to connect with that person. You know, find them on social media. You know, they, they might be very willing to let you take a look at something. Um, yeah, I, I'm not sure how you'd approach it that way, but in terms of write write to your local film critic, ask them ask them for help, ask them who who is the person who is, who is the gatekeeper for screenings and screeners in the area, and quite possibly they can help you. Um, I have a quick question. Um, mm -hmm. Since you have like to write a lot for your career, do you ever find yourself like I guess getting burnt out from writing so much? And like if so, like how do you deal with that? Yeah, it's, um, mm -hmm. especially lately, it's been really, really busy. Um, first of all, I remember what an incredible privilege it is to be able to write for a living. Like, how lucky am I that this is what I do? And so I just take a deep breath and just kind of keep going. And um, I often think about, um, I don't know if you all know, the writer Ian McEwen, he writes uh, novels and a lot of them made into movies. They're, he's a beautiful writer. He wrote something in an interview that always kind of stayed with me. He said, you know, you write and write and write all day and nothing ever goes right. And then suddenly, you have four or five words falling in just the right order. And I thought, yeah, every now and then I feel like I've written just some little phrase like, yeah, yeah that's good. <laughs> and, you know, and that just really kind of sustains you. Uh, one thing I do occasionally, um, which I really recommend you all do, is go back and read something you wrote a while ago that you don't remember. Mm -hmm. And you might be really surprised by how good it is. Every now I look back on something I, I wrote, that 
was good. <laughs> and I'm completely <laughs> astonished. I'm <laughs> still be taken aback. But yeah, you know, it's writing is hard. And sometimes you're not always going to be as inspired every single time. And sometimes you write stuff like, well, this is just good enough and good enough is going to have to do right now. But sometimes you just get it right and you have to take great pleasure in that. And you guys are all really good writers now. You've had those moments and that's, that's what keeps me going. That's what's helpful. And when I hear from readers, that's really helpful too. Mm -hmm. Like the one I made cry this week. That was fun. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I kind of wanted to ask you about your early career. I know you've been at um, Seattle Times for um, a number of years, um, but just kind of before then, um, like post-grad or, or um, even after that, like before you got to um, this publication, like did you have an inkling like that you wanted to go more into journalism or specifically like film criticism? Um, and what kind of like inspired you to get into that? And what was like some of the, the challenges that you faced? You want to hear my origin story? Okay. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> um, okay. I, um, I didn't become a writer until kind of later. I, uh, my undergraduate degree was a double major in English and drama. I was going to be an actor at one point. That didn't really work out. Um, I was an English major because I love to read. I, being a writer wasn't something I really thought about. And then I went to grad school because... That just seemed like a good idea. <laughs> and I got a master's in English Lit, which I loved. And I got a job in the tech industry. And I was working at Microsoft. And let's see, this was, I was in my, around 30. And this is what I was doing. And I really kind of thought this is just what I would do. And then I had a significant health crisis in my life. And sometimes when you have a crisis, um, you, you emerge on the other side and all the pieces are, are rearranged differently. I thought, what do I really want to do? But I think I want to be a writer. I think, I think that's what I'm supposed to do. I think that's why I'm still here. And so I quit my job and I got, I applied at a local alt weekly, at Seattle Weekly, for an internship. I thought I'd be the oldest intern in the world, but that's okay. This is what I, this is what I want to do. And they gave me a job as a copy editor and said, well, you can write bits and pieces on the side if you want to, but you mostly are just going to be putting in the commas and stuff. And then one day at work, this is my, sorry, sorry about all the detail, but it's a good story. Uh, one day at work, um, we're at an editorial meeting and I'm just sitting there taking notes and someone says, has anyone here seen the red shoes? Now, please tell me one of you has seen the red shoes. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yay. <laughs> Gorgeous movie, right? Yep. But uh, I said, you have seen the red shoes. And oh, it's going to be at the museum. And can somebody just write a couple paragraphs about it so the readers know? I said, oh my God. Yeah. So the first thing I ever wrote about movies was a couple paragraphs on the red shoes. And I wrote it and it went in the paper. And then I went to go to the screening. I thought I'd enjoy seeing this movie again. And there was this whole line of people all with that page of the paper. That they had all read this thing that I'd written and they had been inspired to go see the movie. And I thought, oh my God, because it hadn't occurred to me that anyone would actually read it. <laughs> that was the part that I just didn't think about at all. And I thought, what an amazing thing that these people are going to have an amazing experience at this gorgeous movie because of something that I wrote, because I was able to make them feel something and, th and think something. And that made me want to write about movies. And I realized that all through college, I read Pauline Kael obsessively. I would come rushing home after a movie and I would read what she'd written in the New Yorker. And I was fascinated by the way she was able to recreate the movie and twist it and turn it and make me think about it in ways I'd never thought of before. And I thought, why did it not occur to me until I was 30? <laughs> that This is what I really wanted to do. Mm -hmm. So um, basically, so I then just started writing about movies as much as I could. Um, I left the weekly after a while and got a job at film.com, which doesn't exist anymore. But for a while, I was the, the editor and chief writer at a film website. And then at the Seattle Times, um, the gentleman who'd had the job since 1966, <laughs> he retired in 2001. And the job opened up for the first time in pretty much my lifetime. And I was one of many people they interviewed, and I was incredibly fortunate to get the job. So that is that is kind of my windy road <laughs> to become yeah. a film critic in the Seattle Times. But it was really just a big realization that, oh my God, I've always loved movies, I love writing, and what film criticism is, is a way of bringing people to this art form that I just feel so strongly about. So that's that's kind of how I began. I've, I've been really lucky, really, really lucky. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, that, that sounds amazing. Does anyone have any last questions or comments? You can always reach out to me or Moira or Please I email me anytime. I am can happy I to send you an email with like something I've been writing or is that like too much? Uh, you can. Please don't expect me to reply right away. I mean, I'll reply to say hi, thank you. 
and I will look at it when I can. Yeah. But um, sure. Yeah. Yeah. No. Didn't just curious. Mm -hmm. I get these out of the blue a lot, but now since I've met you guys and spent an hour talking with you, you guys can send me stuff, and I will. I will look. At it. <laughs> There's only four of you, so I should be okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, any any last thoughts before we all go back to to quarantine? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, did you already say your some of your favorite movies from this past year? Oh, I don't think it, from this past year. Um, actually, a lot of you have named them. Um, Portrait of a Lady on Fire. I just love that movie so much. I just uh, um, Parasite just took me to places I had no idea that it would ever take me there. Um, those are probably my, my favorite recent ones. Um, I did like The Invisible Man quite a bit. Um, I liked Emma a lot. Um, I also just, in, in answer to the question I asked earlier, favorite movie of all time, people ask me that all the time. And I, at first I always say, I hope I haven't seen it yet. And then when people press, I say, well, it's one of three, depending on the day. And they're all really, really old. They are The Thin Man, The Red Shoes, and Vertigo. And I love all three of them. Actually, Rear Window might sneak in there you know, in a pinch, but those are um, in the mood for love is another one that sometimes I <laughs> would put up there. That's my, yeah, here's my that's my top five today. Director. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I, I only heard half of that. But. I said I said the in the mood for love that that's my favorite director. Oh, yeah. Oh God. Yeah. His work is gorgeous. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I do have one last question. I hope it's sure. it's not too long winded. Um, but like out of maybe the thousands uh, and, and years, um, thousands of reviews and years of, of writing them, um, has there ever been not so much like a movie, but a character in a film that you really identified with um, or that you thought was like so well written or, or beautifully developed or, um, you know, that kind of just challenged you to even, I guess, critique it in a way? Oh, that's such an interesting question. Oh, um, I'm having to mentally run through 3,000 yeah. things in my mind. So I'm not sure I can come up with one for the moment. That, that, is a, that is a really good question, though. But, you know, that, that happens a lot. And I think it's something that we kind of struggle with a bit as critics, is that we, we watch movies and they're about people who are, well, the good movies are about people who are really complicated. And we don't necessarily like them. And I hear from readers a lot that, oh, I didn't like that movie because I didn't like the characters. And I always say, well, we don't have to like characters to like a movie. We just have to find them compelling. And we have to... <laughs> try to understand them and my favorite movies tend to have people in them who are just really complicated but who have that messiness of real life because all of us are complicated people right you know we're not all always likable we're not all always fun and yeah it's i'm always so in awe when a, when a filmmaker can create somebody somebody like that for me and cool. i'll pick a great example as soon as we all sign off i promise <laughs> <laughs> Um, thank you so much, Moira, for hosting. It was so lovely. Um, My pleasure. This is fun. Thank you, just like for being such a, an amazing resource for all of us. Um, thank you, guys, for for showing up. Um, it was amazing to meet you. Um, your, excuse me, your essays on what how to engage younger people in film criticism will be going up as soon as I'm done with my exams. <laughs> um, stay tuned for those. Um, read each other's work on our site so you get to know each other better. Um, I'll send everyone um, if, I mean, yeah, I mean, if you guys want to reach out to each other um, and you want to send me your, like, your handles, if you have, like, you know, whether personal Instagram or film criticism Instagram, I can send those out. Um, and yeah, continue to send me your work so we can publish it and so that, you know, when you go to a festival, you need some sort of um, body of work to point to, you can point to um, our website, you know, or use your personal blog or whatever suits you best. But thank you so much. It was great to meet you and I hope to continue working with you guys in the future. Thank you, Moira. Thank you for asking me. Great to meet you guys. <laughs> Please do email if, you, if, if I can help you with anything at all. Good luck with all of you, your careers and good luck in these, in these days. Stay well. Thank you. Thank you. You too. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.